Good evening, this is Bill Dixon. Uh, welcome to uh, North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Lessons of Vietnam uh, with my co-host tonight, Mr. Bob Matthews. Uh, we have a very special guest tonight. We have uh, Mr. Al Ely, who was uh, Brownwater Navy, uh, PBR, and we'll be getting to him just, uh, just a little bit. But uh, thank you for tuning in with us, and be sure to call in and uh, ask Al some questions and uh, give him some hard questions. Uh, uh, if you got to com- if you're on your computer, come on Skype and uh, and uh, let's have you on the air at the same time. Uh, I'm gonna start out asking uh, Al uh, to get started a little bit. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Al, and uh, then I'm gonna let Bob come in and uh, ask you some uh, questions. Um, where were you, where, where are you from? Let's go that way. <laughs> I'm a damn Yankee. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I moved to North Carolina because I love the weather down here, and I got tired of chopping wood, 13 cords of wood to heat. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, went to high school in Vermont, college in Colorado, and then from there I went to the, I went and, and fortunately became a graduate student at the Jungle School of Warfare for the United States Navy, tongue-in-cheek. Okay, United States, what made you join the Navy? I wanted to fly an airplane. You joined the Navy to fly. Uh, Al, I hate to tell you, but that's the wrong branch of service. The Air Force has airplanes, and Navy has boats. No, Na- Navy has airplanes, and they have lots of jets. And yes, I, wanted they- to, I wanted to fly a jet, and then it became very, very apparent very quickly that I was much more interested in skiing and the young ladies, and so I got removed from that program, and I became an enlisted man in this man's Navy, and they, my first, first series of orders were to Vietnam. Well, that sounds like a good story in itself. I'm gonna, uh, I'm, we're gonna have a brief uh, message about how to call in, how to get out, go in on Skype, and so forth. And when we come back, uh, Bob Matthews, uh, my co-host, will be asking Al some. Uh, uh, Bob's forty-year teacher, and he's got all these technical questions and so forth. And so I'm gonna let Bob handle all of those questions and so forth. Uh, stick with us. We'll be right back. Good evening. My name is Bob Matthews, and I'd like to also welcome Al to the show tonight. Al, welcome to Lessons of Vietnam. Thank you, Bob. Good to be here. Now, many of you know, as we've had the show on for several weeks, and some of the information Bill Dixon has given you, please don't be bashful. Call in tonight with questions or comments. And anytime you want to call, of course, it's 919-518-9773. Well, Al, going back to what Bill started with you, um, tell me a little bit about what you did in Vietnam, but before you tell me exactly what you did, will you tell me your training for what you did? (laughs) Um, In the infinite wisdom of the military, I was actually trained as a communications technician, and when the Enterprise almost sank, which is where I was supposed to go, they sent me as an unattached person to the fleet in Vietnam and said, who needs extra people? And the PBR folks thought the community technician communications technician was a radioman. Uh-huh. So they put me on PBRs as a radioman. Little did they know. <laughs> and so what did I do? For the first month or so, I sat between two fifty caliber machine guns. Ah, it's the infinite wisdom of the military. You never can figure. Never. Well, last week, we had uh, John Odom on, on part one of War on the Water, and I had mentioned that this is the part of Vietnam, I think, that most people, students or even people who study Vietnam, are the least knowledgeable about. The air war they can grasp, the war on the dirt they can grasp, but the war on the water, the Mekong Delta, the rivers, the danger of them. Can you tell me a little bit if you were prepared for what you did? I wasn't prepared at all for what I did, and I felt that the Navy in Vietnam was a very small portion of the conflict. It wasn't until I got home and I got to know Admiral Zumwalt and in talking to him found out how many people actually were on the ground and in country at any one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the training that I got for what I was doing was absolutely nil. It was all on the job training okay. and everything was fed to me as we went along. You know, you mentioned the name Zumwalt. We both have had the pleasure to meet Elmo Zumwalt when he was alive and uh, retired in Texas and in Cary here where his daughter still lives. And I want to ask you a couple of questions about Elmo Zumwalt, because I know you hold him in high regard. Yes, sir. Uh, when you met him, were you prepared for the kind of man that he was? 
I don't know that I was prepared for him. He was my boss. He's my commander in chief in Vietnam, and I had actually met him in Vietnam, uh, and I liked him at that point. But then I was E4, and he was quite a bit higher than me, so you have to like your boss. Uh, but he was very nice, and I never saw any reason to think of him being other than a really nice person who cared for his people. You know, it was it was not funny. It was ironic when we went to Texas, and, of course, you were with us that trip, where he was the key speaker at Texas Tech University. Mm -hmm. And we were at a teacher conference there with, I think, maybe 300 Texas teachers who were attempting to put Vietnam in their curriculum. And we kind of had a model I wanted to see. Well, we, there was a lot of uh, talking and a lot of... Uh, after after school, if you would, sessions, and we happened to have dinner with Elmo Zuma one night, and he asked me some questions about um, the Navy, how much did I know about it. Well, my father was in the Navy in World War II. I knew a little bit about it. But then when, when I got to meet Al and John Odom and some of the people, as the more research we did over and over again, I realized how important, and I want to use the word properly, Al, how important Zuma was to Vietnam but the word I want to be careful with was how guilty he felt. And he shared that with me one night, and I know you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Would you care to comment on, you were on the river with, with Agent Orange, you know what he did. Yes, and um, I can say one specific instance, he saved, saved a lot of us from a lot of grief by doing exactly what he did. We were, get, we were ambushed constantly from this one spot. And every time we went by it, and we knew it was going to happen. And so he, he arranged to send some people in to defoliate that one area on the river. And when they did, we found a concrete bunker that none of us suspected was there. And once I removed that, we had no more trouble in that part of the river. So as far as I was concerned, he saved us. It wasn't until much later that we realized the damage that had been caused by all of this. So um, we didn't know. I guess we were kind of lied to. Well, what he told me, or he asked me, he took his hand, he was a very strong man, and he took his hand and he grabbed my hand and he said, when you teach Vietnam, do not skirt the truth. Yes, sir. Teach the students everything. Yes, sir. Tell them Admiral Elmo Zumwalt sprayed Agent Orange to defoliate the jungle, to defoliate the riverbanks, so our men wouldn't be sitting ducks. Correct. And you were one of those men. Yes, sir. Then he said, the... Ironic thing was, so was his son. Yes, sir. Who eventually died. Now, I don't know if I can make that connection, but he made it to me that night without me even asking. He said, indirectly, I probably caused my son's death. Indirectly, he probably did cause his son's death, but that's the position of a commander-in-chief, is to make decisions. The decisions might not be popular ones, but at the time, with the information we had, it was a good decision. We had a student in Low High School named Luke Weingartner, and his mother had cancer. And Luke and I visited his mother in the hospital one day, and Luke was reading a book called My Father, My Son. Yes, sir. The Zumo story. Mm -hmm. And ironically, the Dr. Crane was his name at Rex. Dr. Crane looked at Luke and saw the book, and he said, wait a minute. I operate on Elmo Jr. I was his doctor when he was here. He had already passed away. And he asked Luke what he was doing with that book. And he says, I'm taking a course called Lessons of Vietnam. And Al, that leads me into my next question hmm. with you because um, you talked about the Coast Guard. You talked about the naval operations in Vietnam. And most people, like you said, aren't aware of the great amount that the Navy did in Nam. You said you weren't prepared when you went there. So my question is obvious. Was it worth it? In retrospect, Honestly, I don't know whether it was. We had 100,000 naval personnel in country Vietnam at any one time. And when Admiral Zumwalt told me that number, it absolutely blew me away. Because we, we operated in a division of six boats. No, we had 12 boats. There were five guys on a boat, and we lived on an LST. So there were probably about 160 guys on the LST. So we were a very small cog. But when we got together in operations, there were always more people and many more assets around. So there were lots of assets. Um, I wasn't prepared to go on a PBR because that's only 31 feet long. It has lots of firepower. I'd never seen a 50 caliber weapon before in my life until I sat between two of them. Uh, M16, um, an M60, we were well armed for a 31-foot yes. boat. 
and we had lots of protection. We thought, coming back to the States many years later, seeing one of the armor plates I used to hide behind, and we <laughs> shot at it with a forty five and it shattered. So I kind of wonder, I guess it wasn't my time while I, I was there. <laughs> I guess not. Well, you know, a lot came to light about the war on the water <clears throat> with the infamous John Kerry incident with the swift boats and all that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. John's Purple mm-hmm. Hearts and so on. I kid you a lot saying uh, John Kerry and all that. So let's get to the chase. Oh, no. John mm-hmm. Kerry, his legacy, his story, how much of it do you know of being true or false? A lot of it's true. Um, when that first talk came up, I went through all my pictures, which I had never looked at. From Vietnam, I took all these pictures, sent them home, and they were slides, and I put them in a box. And when he ran for president and all this swift boat stuff came up, I got all the pictures out to see if I had pictures. I had pictures of his boat and pictures of the other men, other boats with him, but no pictures of John Kerry. Um, but they all talked about it. They came aboard the LST that we lived on because we were when we were down in the southern part of the, of the river, out toward the, the mouth, the guys could come in and get fuel and get food, ice cream, water, uh, that, uh, a little bit fresher than they got out on Float One. And sometimes they'd stay and watch a movie or they'd trade movies out with us. And these guys were all talking about this <laughs> one guy that just wouldn't follow the rules. And in retrospect, I have to believe that they were talking about John Kerry. Sure. I happened to be uh, lucky enough to be at a conference two years ago in Boston. And he ran into the author of the book, uh, I Defeat the Command. Yes, and sir. And we were sitting there talking about it. And he said... Uh, he went over and over and over again how John Kerry was a fake. And I asked him one question. I said, did John Kerry serve in Vietnam? He said, yes, he did. I said, did he serve honorably? He said, yes, he did. Mm-hmm. I said, then what's your problem? Well, I know John Kerry's gunner. I have met John Kerry's gunner. And, yes, he was in Vietnam. Yes, he served honorably. Some of the, There was lots of questions. And who knows? We weren't there. It's just like. People give us grief. We tell them, you weren't walking on our shoes. I wasn't walking in our shoes. So I really should just be quiet because I was not there. Took a lot of grief, handled it well. Now is a very high position, has run for president, as you said before. Vietnam has quite a legacy. It seems like the longer we talk about individuals in Vietnam and um, some of the uh, people that caused a lot of discontent, the stories are never completely told. So I'll have a few names for you, okay? <laughs> Navy names. Do I have to remember them? No, you don't. Now, one of the names that was ironically connected to Vietnam was a man, a man named Lloyd Booker, who mm-hmm. commanded USS Pueblo. Yes, sir. Now, Lloyd has passed away a few years ago, and I had the privilege several years ago to interview him in San Diego, and he still was mad. He was mad about what happened in 68, and being a Navy man as you are, did Lloyd Booker, in his actions that day, oh boy. do the right thing? I don't know if he did, did the right thing, but I think he did the only thing he could do. I personally have believed, and you all have to understand, that I was only an enlisted man. I only went got to an E-5 when I came home, which is very low on the totem pole. But after having read his story and talking to people about it, and I had some other friends who were in crypto type of work, that Booger was hung out to dry. We have uh, written a lot of letters. We've tried a lot of research in our course called Lessons of Vietnam. And I think one of the lessons, Al, that we try to teach the students and we try to teach the people that pay attention to what we're saying is don't be afraid to ask hard questions. Keep looking for the truth. Keep asking questions. Well, we have written, being we, our group has written the past four presidents on NCBVI stationery, asking if he would negotiate the purchase of the Pueblo, the vessel itself. Right now it's a museum as communist (laughs) propaganda in North Korea. Would you be in favor of this country buying the Pueblo, bringing it back here? Personally, no. I think it ought to be destroyed, and I think we ought to do it. Well, I like that answer. (laughs) They should have sunk it when they took it from one coast to the other, but our quote-unquote, spy people weren't on the ball and didn't catch that it was at sea and we could have gotten it very easily with modern-day weapons. Well, Al, as you, you give us an insight into the war on the water, when you came home from Vietnam, as this pretty well um, documented, 
Most of the Vietnam veterans were not treated very well when they came back. Most did not have anyone that wanted to hear their story, except maybe their loved ones, maybe their wives or brothers and sisters. So how was your homecoming, and how did you diffuse Vietnam? Interesting. When I came back, my father met me in Newark Airport in Newark, New Jersey, and we had a six-hour wait waiting for my mother and my sister coming from someplace else. And my father spent six hours on, on the beach in Normandy, scared to death. So when we got to talking, I was trying to ask questions and find out about his experience because he never wanted to talk about it. And he said, no, your war is a lot more different. Uh, your war was worse than ours. <laughs> I just I had a hard time believing that. Mm -hmm. While I was talking to him, there was a humongous crowd gathering in the airport. And I wasn't paying much attention, but about the time we went out onto the tarmac to meet my mother's airplane, this crowd was out there, and there was a Mac V plane taxiing into the terminal, and it was full of Army personnel, and they were all being released in a group to go on leave, and these people were there to greet them. Not with, with friends, they were there to throw bags of urine, they were throwing eggs, they were throwing uh, whatever they could get their hands on, and calling them all kinds of bad names. Now here I was, a 21-year-old that had been to a combat zone, had stayed alive and come home doing what I had been told to do, to stay alive, stay out of trouble, and here all these people were saying all these nasty things about something we had just done, and I didn't understand it. So as a result, I changed the civilian clothes, and my first wife didn't even know I had been to Vietnam. I never talked about it. So that's how I handled Vietnam. You know, one of the, one of the things we've talked about years ago Go ahead. Hello? This is Bob. Go ahead. Did, Did you have a question? I guess they didn't want to talk to me. No, yeah. I, I didn't, couldn't tell that you were talking to me. Can you hear oh, me okay? Oh, yeah, we can hear you now. We can hear you now, sir. All right, very good. I, uh, I had some, I'm 59, and my draft number was 66 the year that Vietnam was going on and they discontinued the draft. I had nightmares about showing up in swamps. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine what you guys went through. I just, it just, I don't know how you live through that and, and come back a normal human being and how you cope with that. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I, I Go ahead. I'm sorry? Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. So I, I've had some interesting conversations in the last few days about Vietnam with a, uh, a friend of mine who is only 28 years old. And he is probably sharper than a lot of the 28 years old because he he's looking back and saying, why Vietnam? What got us into Vietnam? Why were we there? Was it an honorable war? Why were we there? Should we have been there? Why were our veterans treated, <coughs> excuse me, the way they were when they returned? And you know what? There's so much time has passed, and because I don't have the firsthand experience that you guys have, I'm not sure how to answer those questions. I'd like for you to elaborate on those of, that you would wish to care to elaborate on. Okay. Well, you know, sir, um, <clears throat> I don't think you ever come back the same. When you leave your comfort zone, as Al mentioned before, and you go to a combat zone and you give up 365 days, you never can get them back. Whether you're in combat, behind the lines, you lose a full year of your life. Why we went to Vietnam is a fairly easy question to answer. Our foreign policy then obviously was containment. Wherever communism was arising, we were going to be there to counteract communism, as we did in Europe, as we did in Korea as we did in Cuba, and as we always will do, as long as there's communism in the world. Al, please jump in anytime you want. Well, I was dying saying definitely I came back feeling different. I felt I was a lot older than most of the other people that I was hanging around with, and nobody from my high school class went to Vietnam. So when I went to my high school reunions, there was nothing to talk about. So again, I didn't talk about Vietnam. Um, as to why we were there, we, as young people, were responding to the military or the organization that we were part of, we were told to go, so you say yes, sir, and you go. You don't question all those things. It isn't until you get older and you step back and are able to look at some of this 
that you realize that maybe we shouldn't have been there. Maybe there's another reason. And I think we're facing one of those as we speak today right here that we really need to take a step back and look at why we're going to be doing it. You know, another thing, too, sir, about Vietnam is that the Vietnam veterans for a long time, not that they didn't want to talk, they didn't have an audience. And I was uh, very fortunate as I come back from Vietnam. I had already been a college graduate, and I was a teacher. And I um, had like a mission was to teach Vietnam where it wasn't taught before. And I was very lucky to meet the North Carolina Vietnam veterans, men like Bill Dixon and Al Ely, who were willing to go with me to the forefront and teach Vietnam where it was never taught before. We needed a lot of assets, we needed a lot of guts, and we needed, needed some napalm. Because <laughs> <laughs> a few bridges had to come down. And they did. But as we moved on, sir, the Vietnam veterans had a a haven, if you will, in Wake County to speak. And they had students who wanted to hear what they had to say. And that made all the difference in the world. I think the men and women that came into my classes and other teachers' classes in Wake County schools got much more out of it than the students did. And Al was one of the charter members that came in and really chaperoned a class in Athens Drive, has become one of the best classes in the state. Al, would you agree or disagree that speaking about Vietnam with the students is good for the best? Well, I didn't know I had a problem until I started speaking to the students. And as I have met other veterans who've had a hard time coming home, if you can invite them to go to a class with you, and they can sit in the back of the class and listen, and finally there will be a question that they can answer, and you let them answer that question, then it's time for you to sit down and be quiet and let this person start to talk because all of a sudden they have opened up and they have started to come home. So this class, this Lessons of Vietnam, has been a wonderful eye-opener for a whole lot of people who for the first time can say that they were in Vietnam and talk about it with a good feeling. You know, Al, some of the stories, and they're, they're heartwarming and they're heartbreaking. When someone says to you, I was in Vietnam, I don't want to talk about it, and you know they do. They want to talk about it, or they wouldn't say they don't want to talk about it. There's a lot of issues. Some did not tell their kids, some did not tell their wives. It was one of those things they kept quiet in the closet. All of a sudden, Lessons of Vietnam appears in Millbrook, at Athens, at Cary, at Enlow, at Gardner. As Bill mentioned many times, this class started with one class at Enlow High School. And now we have it in over 700 schools, not wow. bragging, just fact, that vet veterans throughout the nation now can sit down, can talk about Vietnam, can answer questions, can do more and more research. And, sir, I hope we're answering some of your questions tonight. Well, you are. I've got a, a week's worth, but I'll, I'll spare you. But, <laughs> okay. but, but Bob, to yes. some extent, don't you feel like you're having to defend your honor? No, I don't. Because, you know, when I went to the wall years ago, and a, a woman, I was talking up there, and a woman asked me, she said, uh, do you have survivor guilt that you survived Vietnam and now you're a teacher and all that kind of stuff? And I said, no, I don't. I have what's called survivor responsibility. I think all of us that came back from Vietnam have a responsibility to speak for the men and women on the wall, the families that suffered for what they went through. To not avoid Vietnam, you don't have to blow your own horn, but you certainly do not ignore it. You speak to the students, you speak to your communities, and you get that part of history alive in the books. And you let people ask very hard questions, like you're doing tonight, sir. I do not feel I'm defending my honor. I feel I am telling a story that 58,271 men and women cannot tell. Well, I'm, I am impressed with your answer, and I'm glad that it's true. I've got another painful question, and please, I think you can tell by what I've said so far, I mean absolutely no disrespect in any way, shape, or form. Why did we lose that war? We didn't lose it, sir. We were winning when we left. Uh, could you speak up a little bit? I couldn't hear you. We did not lose the war. We were winning when we left. Sir, I'm going to chime in here, too, and I agree completely. <laughs> We went into Vietnam in 1965 with a 
containment policy to stop communism. We drew the line in the sand in Vietnam. We were going to stop it there. The wall in Germany was going to come down. Communism would not go to Cambodia. It would not go to Indonesia. It would not go to Laos. It would not go to Australia. It would stop in Vietnam. We hope for a peace settlement like Korea, a North and South Vietnam, North and South Korea. It never did happen. I was back in Vietnam since the war four times. And last year with Bill Dixon and the Bridgeback Group, we went back to an orphanage. And we talked about this to the people in Vietnam. Communism for all respects is dead. It took us 42 years, but we won the war. Bob, can I step in just a minute? Uh, I spent the weekend with uh, Vietnamese uh, military, uh, South Vietnamese military. Uh, when Saigon fell in 1975, he was put into a re-education camp for eight years. And basically, the United States did not lose the war. We pulled out in 73. Uh, but there's a little thing called the Cooper Church Amendment that was passed by Congress that did not allow us at all to supply the South Vietnamese people with weapons, medicine, or anything else. But the North Vietnamese were continued supplied by the uh, Russians and the Chinese. But the Americans, because of Cooper Church, could not do the things that they were they had promised to do. Kissinger and Nixon basically sold out the South Vietnamese people. They signed a, a treaty with North Vietnam, did not allow South Vietnam to sign it, that allowed North Vietnam soldiers to remain in South Vietnam. Basically, they just wanted to get out of the war and get away. So they fought about, uh, really hard and very well, the South Vietnamese people, but they were fighting the Russians, they were fighting the North Vietnamese, they were also fighting the Chinese and getting help from nobody. So they were uh, continued fighting until they had nothing left to fight with. Uh, so basically the American uh, military uh, served honorably. You asked a while ago what was honorable war. They served honorably. Uh, unfortunately, I don't personally feel like our government was actually uh, worked honorably when they walked off and left the uh, Vietnamese people and their war with the Church, uh, Cooper Church and other things. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea also. Absolutely. It's a perspective that, that I'm a victim of the media, and I'm not normally going to be able to hear the side of the story, which is so important for you guys doing what you are doing. And, and I'll close by saying this. Having lived through it, I think that the reception uh, that you guys got when you returned I've thought about it. I think it's one of the biggest blights on American history. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your questions tonight and your interest. Thank you. Now, Al, I have for you an Iron City six-pack of questions. Uh-oh. Now, I didn't say Iron City light. I said the real stuff. Okay? <laughs> in the refrigerator, I hope it's cold. It's very cold. In Vietnam had the personalities. We already talked about Zumwalt, Booker, and some of these. But one man who we had the privilege to talk to a couple times was a man named William Calley. And one of the eyesores of Vietnam, our guest just mentioned the uh, media, was My Lai. Yes, sir. And Bill Calley seemed to get the brunt of the um, disgust, the whole thing on My Lai. And I know we heard about it after the fact. What is your comment now, looking back on the My Lai incident, how it's handled in the history books? Well, how it's handled in the history books, to me, is wrong. But it they're the, the power, the higher-ups decided how they were going to deal with it. And rather than the higher-ups getting in trouble, they made a lower down get in trouble. And they piled all they could on that poor man. Not to say he didn't deserve some of what he got, but I don't think he deserved all of what he got. I had the privilege to talk to Bill Kelly a few months ago. He's now located in Atlanta, and he's starting to talk a bit. Now, Bill, for a long time, had uh, a gag order and he was on house arrest. There was quite a uh, disturbance in America about him when he was convicted. And his superior officer was a man named Ernest Medina in Minnesota, who I contacted and ran him down for an interview, and he hung up on me twice. And Bill was willing to talk a bit, but not a lot. He was eventually pardoned by Richard Nixon, and now he is speaking 
about My Lai on a very guarded book tour. A book will be out the first of the year, Bill Kelly's Me Lai. That's what I think we ought to read. Because every time I do some Me Lai research, the, the body count increases. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, my next question to you is something that a lot of the people talk about in this country. They get their knowledge about Vietnam from movies. The Rambos, the different Apocalypse Now, Good Morning Vietnam, and so forth. Now, you and I had the pleasure a few years ago to introduce some students to the wall at Enloe High School with a movie called To Heal a Nation. I remember that. And, Al, you were selected because a lot of the students really respect you, as they should. And they did not want to go to the wall in D.C. without the proper information. They wanted to go there kind of informed. They wanted to be prepared. And they were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to this day, when I see students who are now in their 30s and maybe even 40s, I'm giving my age away, they say... Oh, you're only 29, Bob. <laughs> they say, remember the, the time you and Al Ely brought that new concept into Wake County Schools called a in-house field trip. Because usually, I've told some of the teachers just at Wake County Schools, if you show a movie in class, kids might have a dentist appointment. You show a bit here, a piece there, they miss the movie. If you show the movie in its entirety with someone like Al along to guide them through the movie, the in-house field trip, they talk about that to this day. Well, it was different. It was different because they didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go to the wall at all. It was when I first came down to North Carolina, I bumped into a very tall individual, Bud Gross, at the fairgrounds, and he eyed me over the crowd. We made eye contact, and I did everything I could do to get away from him. But he still handed me a business card that said a little bit about North Carolina and Vietnam Veterans, Inc. And I sat on that card for about three months, and went to a meeting, and the very next Thursday, I think, all of us went to D.C., and I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> but I was with fellow Vietnam veterans, yes, and I were. knew that yes, I would were. be taken care of if I had a problem or I made a fool out of myself. Instead, we helped a, a, <laughs> a combat engineer who happened to be female tangled with the reporter because he asked her if she was a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Oh, Lee Wilson. Well, Al, you know, I have a, I always ask this question to all of our guests, whether it's on the show or in, in class, and I think it's something that our caller may be addressed a little bit, and I think I'd like you to ad address this if you would. Um, how has Vietnam, serving in Vietnam, changed your life? Hmm. It made me want to come home and be a little bit bigger than an E5. That's for doggone sure. That's why I'm the CEO of, of a company that I have a partner with. I didn't want to be an E5 anymore. <laughs> as far as how it changed my life, I think it taught me to have a little bit more humor in my life. Because uh, Vietnam is mighty cotton picking serious, but we managed to remember the good times. I don't remember too many of the bad times. If we really get serious and modeling, I'm sure we can come up with some. But it's much easier to remember the fun. And we did have some fun because there was a great bunch of people. We were all really young. We didn't know what we were doing. And <laughs> That's true. That's we true. had all these guns and all this ammo. And if you grew up on a farm, you liked to shoot. And we did like to shoot. But I want to go back to the Navy in on the water. And... Most people, unless you look at a map, don't understand that Vietnam had very, very few roads in the southern part of the country from yeah. Saigon south. So the only way that you could get around is either by a helo or helicopter or by boat. And they had lots and lots of sampans that went in and out of these little tiny creeks. We call them creeks. They call them canals. Yeah. And they were moving personnel, food, ammunition, all that stuff around on the canals. And we did not have, in 1967... We did not have the ability to, to deal with that. So they got some boats from North Carolina, and they took them over and made them the PBR, first PBRs, Mark Ones, And they began to put these armed, heavily armed boats 
very shallow drafts on the rivers, and they began to interdict the troops. And by 1968, we had a really good organized group of, of these PBR. It seems to me we had something like 125 of these boats in country. Yes. And we did an awful lot of interdiction. We were the local police force on the river. Yes. And we would go out there and try to stop the traffic from the river, the infiltration of all the stuff going down through the south. And we made a difference. Yes, you did. We made a difference. And most people don't know that we were in country, in Vietnam, living with the locals, so to speak. We lived on a ship, but some of the PBR guys lived on land, like in Vinh Long, where you all went and visited a couple of years ago. And they got to work with the locals and learn some of the local traits, if you will. Sure. We did not on the boat. But Navy had a lot of personnel in country Vietnam. I, I, I still say, when we compare the, the four wars in Vietnam, we have uh, finished the air war and the water war. We've got to get to the dirt pretty soon. Uh, I've always considered the people on the water in the most in harm's way the most. The most dangerous fighting in Vietnam, I've always thought, was on the water. Well, you but, thought it was on the water. We thought it was the helos because it looked like every bullet was going straight for the helicopter. That's true. The guys in the helos thought that we were sitting ducks, so I think we were all pretty lucky we were here talking about it today. I think we are. But I can't uh, let you go and turn you back over to Mr. Dixon until I tell a famous Al Ely story. Uh-oh. Now I know I'm in trouble. Now, we, we go to Athens Drive, as I told you before. Al has helped there help a young teacher named Jim Baum become one of the finest teachers in the state, teaching Vietnam, maybe in the country. But we also got, through Al's contacts and Jim Baum, a audience with the real Adrian Kronhauer. As Al mentioned about the humor in Vietnam, we all remember the movie Good Morning Vietnam. Well, we're up in D.C., and we're huddled at this place getting some breakfast, and Al comes running up, and all the Athens Drive kids are there. We're going to go to the wall. They've all got their names in their pockets. They're going to rub the wall. It was a big, big deal. Al comes running up and says, I got John Bon Jovi's autograph. I got Bon Jovi's autograph. Everybody ran to Al. Said, what did you, you get? What did you get? John, he said, just kidding. Let's go to the wall. They could have <laughs> killed him, but he had to keep it light. And Al, I can't thank you enough, like I do with most of the veterans, but especially several of the charter members. Lessons of Vietnam would be nothing if it weren't for men like you. And I thank you. Thank you, Bob. And you don't know what you did for all of us, too. So it works both ways. And now I'm turning you back over to my, co my co-host, Mr. Bill Dixon. All right. Thank you. Well, here we are back, uh, Bill Dixon. Uh, Bob had, uh, as usual, in-depth, good, uh, deep questions and so forth. I do want to carry on a little bit about a while ago when we talked about the, uh, the gentleman came in on the phone. We really appreciate you calling in and asking us Mike. some questions. Mike, uh, thank you very much. Uh, call back uh, when we're on the show again in two weeks, and uh, we can continue with your questions and ask some more questions. And Maybe you ought to get that 28-year-old to uh, tune in also and uh, see the show. Um, uh, moving along that line, uh, it's, so, it's somewhat now become known that uh, actually Nixon, uh, when Johnson was still president, actually went to the uh, Chinese and told the Chinese to tell the North Vietnamese to uh, not sign anything because they'd get a better deal when he got there. Uh, which kind of prolonged the uh, peace talks a little bit there, if you want to call them peace talks. They argue more about the size of the table than anything else. But uh, moving back to the important part now is Al. Al, sometimes as Vietnam vets, we forget that uh, we had our own language in Vietnam, and we won't go into most of the words we used. But, uh, we only used one or two. <laughs> one or two, and it was in every sentence, or it wasn't a complete sentence. But we talk about a PBR. What is a PBR? I mean, it's, it's a... Surfboard with a motor? I mean, what is it? I mean, a PBR is a patrol boat river or a river patrol boat. And it was fiberglass so that it would be lightweight. It was uh, water jet drive so we didn't draw very much water. It weighed about two and a half tons with all the armor plate we had on board. We were told they would travel at a high rate of speed. They did, maybe 18 knots with all that armor on board. 
Um, the, the best part about the Navy, and is why I'm glad that I ended up in the Navy and not the infantry, we got to ride everywhere we went. Yeah, I've talked to you before. You didn't even get any leeches, and you were on no, the water. No, I didn't even get any leeches that's, on, that's on the water. That's not fair. <laughs> Those of us who slide through the mud got leeches and so forth. Uh, that, you mentioned it was fiberglass. Fiberglass is really good for stopping bullets, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The, the engine block is even better. Yeah. Now, we talked about uh, uh, Patrol Boat River, or Riverboat Patrol, whatever. Uh, now, we also talked a little bit about uh, uh, John Kerry. He was on a swift boat. Give me a comparison between the two and why one was different from the other. Well, a swift boat would probably be a Jaguar, and a PBR would probably be a Volkswagen. Um, we didn't move that fast. The swift boats actually had less had less gun in, gun gunnery weapons on board than a PBR did. Uh, it was bigger, I think about 60 feet long, and they had 30-foot props underneath, which meant they couldn't go in the shallow water. So they only operated down by the delta, whereas the PBRs went in the rivers from one end of the country to the other end of the country, in some cases into Cambodia. Oh, that's right, we weren't supposed to go there. Um, and we went up these little tiny canals, and we could turn around on our own length. Swift boat wouldn't do that. Swift boat had rudders. We had those jets, so you could turn the jets one direction or the other, and you could actually turn it around in its own length. And I think the only time I drew blood is when they did that, and I wasn't hanging on. Uh, did you uh, get in the water? No, I did not go in the water. I hung on to the back end of my machine gun and yelled a few of those unmentionable words yeah. we talked about earlier. Hey, well, Al, I have a question. What's the brown water? The brown water, um, as opposed to blue water, blue water is that sea where the water looks blue. The brown water in Vietnam, all of the rivers are brown, and those of us who live in North Carolina with all of the mud in the rivers from the construction these days, that's brown water. So when I'm in, in uh, North Carolina, I feel very much like I was also in Vietnam, that all this water is rushing downstream, and it happens because it floods. The delta floods at least once a year, and that's why they can grow so much food, because they're not putting fertilizer and stuff as we know it, uh, man-made fertilizer. They're getting their swamp in the fields every year by all this mud that's coming down from China, probably, uh, and they have very good crops. As a result, it's brown water, so we called everybody in Vietnam brown water, part of the brown water fleet. And it was not fun to swim in because you could not see your hand as soon as you put it in the water. Yeah, uh, as a Vietnam vet, um, you can tell uh, one reason it was brown water too. You can uh, look out at the river and there's kids out there swimming, and and then you see Mama Son. Anybody that was over 18, there was Mama Son, was female, and if they were over 18, they were male, they were Papa Son, and everybody under that was Baby Son. We kept that. That was how we keep up with who was who. But you see uh, baby sons out there swimming. You see mama son getting uh, washing clothes in the same river. And then maybe another mama son right next to her is filling up the pot for dinner. And then right maybe 50 feet from them is also somebody relieving themselves in the river. Uh, so they, uh, that was one of the reasons the way the water was uh, kind of uh, unique into itself. It was served for all purposes. I think all we can say is it's a good thing that it had the rapid current that it had. Yes. Yes. All right. Now, uh, did you sleep on the uh, PBR or? No, sir. We operated off of the PBR. It was too small. There were no bunks on board. Uh, we were based off of an LST, which in the Navy vernacular is a large, slow target. Oh, that's not right. It's a landing ship tank. They were used during World War II to land uh, military personnel and vehicles. Flat bottom. Didn't draw a whole lot of water, so it was perfect for operating in the rivers in Vietnam, and we did manage to run aground once in a while. But because we had a flat bottom, it was fairly easy to back off. So it was somewhat like a barge? Somewhat like a barge. The uh, John Odom, who was, you mentioned was in last time, they lived on a barge, and they were picked up from that barge by PBRs, by tango boats, by helicopters to go out and do their job during the day. We operated always in the water, always looking to protect we operated on the outside of the Army, trying to stay ahead of them, and we operated on our own looking for, as I mentioned earlier, stuff that wasn't supposed to be there. 
Well, let me ask you another question here. Is it true that y'all got ice cream? Yes, sir. Absolutely. We'd get the YFR tied up, tied up alongside our ship, and the YFR was a fleet, uh, I don't know what the heck the YFR stands for, it was refrigerated. Nine times out of ten, since we were the furthest up the river, the refrigeration wasn't working very well. And so they would tell us that there was ice cream, and by the time we got everything offloaded on that thing and they put the pallet of ice cream down on the deck, it was melting. It was melting so fast that the cook didn't want it below decks in our freezer, so everybody grabbed a half a gallon of ice cream, and we got maybe a cup of this kind of soupy ice cream out of it. But it was ice cream. So that's why they got combat pay, because their ice cream was melted. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And uh, and that's where you you uh, do you ate sea rations, I guess, during the day when you're on the boat, or what? You yes, they gave us usually when we went out. They gave us a couple of boxes of sea rations, and the uh, man who was in charge always turned them upside down, so we couldn't pick and choose what we were what we <laughs> what we wanted. We picked and choose what we got. But when we weren't on patrol, we ate on the Navy ship, and the food was good. We had a couple of really good cooks on that Navy ship. And we lived in air conditioning spaces for most of the trip. We had fresh water, so we had it pretty. We had it pretty nice. Sorry, Grand Pounders. That's all right. Uh, we mentioned a while ago before we started the show a, a movie, uh, Apocalypse Now. Oh <laughs> yes. And was that a PBR? It was in in that movie there. Well, it was a PBR, but the one they picked up with the helicopter was a twelve foot model of the PBR. Okay. I, I always wondered how they did that. A little PBR. It was a little PBR and only had one thruster on the back. Well, so. listen, in the movie, the guy uh, went water skiing or, or surfing behind the uh, PBR. Yes, sir, we did that, too. You did that, too? Mm -hmm. Okay. You'd go to R&R, &R, go to Japan, somebody brought back a pair of water skis. That's, that's all she wrote. But we did have a Boston Whaler that had a much better engine, was much better suited for water skiing. And yeah, oh. we did water ski. Okay. All right, so uh, until uh, I, we did water ski on a fair, fairly good bit until one of our troops got bitten by one of those feared snakes and died sitting on the dock, and none of us ever put our foot in the water again. It brings only needed to happen yeah. once. That brings another point. If I, I remember the, uh, I, I used to tell classes Vietnam has little people and big everything else. Uh, mosquitoes are kind of like hummingbird. I, I, What'd y'all do for mosquitoes on the out there on the, along the river? Well, on the, out on the river, the mosquitoes didn't bother us too much, and if they were bad, and we were along the banks. We just went faster; they couldn't keep up. Okay, and uh, how about how about the snakes? They, were they have a tendency to come out and? and we never see? saw any snakes on the boat. The snakes were in the in the rushes along the edge of the river. Mm -hmm. We did see a fair amount of those when we were dropping soldiers off. Yeah. So the ground, ground panels, again, got the, got the they seat, got, got the, They got the fun stuff. Okay, with the leeches and stuff. And the worst part was when we went in to pick them up and they were covered with mud, we yell at them not to bring the mud on our boat. That would be a very very nice of them to oh, bring on. Not very nice. Yeah, you know, to get your boat muddy and so forth like that. I tell you, it's uh, it, was, it must have been tough. I mean, all the hot meals. and What did you do for a shower, though? That's, that's, uh, well, we... We'd get on the ship. Oh, that's right. They used the fresh water showers on the Navy uh, In that luxury hotel y'all stayed on, you had showers yes, and everything. We did. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, during the course of a day, uh, on an average day, how many times, how much did you contact you come up with the uh, the Vietnamese people themselves? Uh, how much exposure, how much uh, uh, time or on an average day did you... Uh... You know, that's an interesting question. Nobody's ever asked that question before. Most of our contact was with the Vietnamese people. When we would stop somebody to talk to, to talk to them or interdict, they, it was always Vietnamese people, and it was hard to understand. Sometimes we went out with uh, interpreters. Most of the time, it was through sign language. We wanted to see their papers. We wanted to look in their boats, and most of their boats were so small that all you had to do was look in them. And they were like an open canoe, uh, and it was a little bit difficult. But as we were there longer, people began began to pick up some words of Vietnamese, and we knew enough to how to ask them for what we were looking for. And most of them knew we were looking for papers and, and that kind of stuff. All right, you, got, you saw their papers. Did you read Vietnamese? No, they were official papers and they were written in English. <laughs> oh, okay, written in English. Okay. All right, thank you. That's, uh, I, I was getting ready to say, you know, looking at papers written in Vietnamese uh, didn't, I mean, didn't seem to me a lot, but written in English. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty good. So uh, you would uh, basically come up on... 
Uh, it, it's kind of like being a highway patrolman, though. You know, you stop a car and you yeah, don't know but there exactly. Always two, there was always two of us. There was two boats. When we went out on a mission, there was always at least two boats, a lead boat and a cover boat. The lead boat went in, usually locked and loaded, but nobody was manning the weapons. And then the cover boat would come in locked and loaded with everybody in position. And they would be sitting off to the side where we were out of the way, and they had a good good shot, uh, a good coverage of the of the boat that we were questioning people on. Um, but I only did that for about three months. And then it turned out that I understood fiberglass work. And so I got, for the rest of my tour, I got to fix these things when everybody else broke them. Mm -hmm. And so when you talked about them being really good for bulletproof, the one thing about the fiberglass, when it got shot, it didn't shatter. The bullets just went through it. But when they ran into the other boats, the bigger sampans, they would break the fiberglass. They weren't very strong. There was no one reinforcement. So the military or the Navy went through in 1968 with a rendition called the Mark II, which had aluminum all the way around the edge. So that it took a lot of abuse when you bumped up against the sandpan. The only problem was when it got shot with a 51 caliber bullet, that bullet broke apart or it tore everything up, whereas the fiberglass it just went through it. So no longer we no longer felt as safe because the ammo, when we were getting shot at, the bullets would bounce off that, all that aluminum because it was pretty thick aluminum. But they went faster, and they were bigger, and they were more comfortable. Yeah. All right. Uh, I know you still uh, do some uh, sailing and boating now. And uh, uh, did you get what you were doing? Had you done some sailing and, and boating before you went into the Navy? Or Yes, sir. Yeah, I sailed, sailed competitively when I was smaller. Okay. And um, could never afford the gas, so I never had a power boat. That wasn't until I got older and decided I didn't like going so slow on a sailboat. Uh, I, I've always enjoyed the water. I still enjoy the water. I'd love to own a PBR. I found one in a field in Madison, Wisconsin, and went to talk to the farmer about it, and he wasn't going to sell it. The next time I went by, I stopped again, and it was gone, and he sold it. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I know a guy that does a lot with restored vehicle, military vehicles. Maybe he can find you a PBR. I don't want one now. Uh, oh, okay, you don't want one. You and I both have a friend out on the out on the coast that would love to have a PBR, and there is one out there. Oh, is there? Yes, there is. He what said he was a PBR. He's, he was a, he was a marine. Well, they still like the water, too, because oh, okay. they had to ride with us to get yeah. where they were going. All right. Uh, you, would you go back, do it again? Not knowing what I know now, I wouldn't. Okay. And when you guys go back and do the things that, that you do to help the Vietnamese people, I'll support you all day long, but I really don't want to go back to Vietnam. Um, I know it's a beautiful country, and I love looking at the pictures that I took. I took quite a few, and I like looking behind what I took the picture of, and that's when I realized the beauty of the country that was behind the war. Okay. I, I understand your thought pattern there, uh, but let me, let me kind of throw this, uh, get you something to think about. You didn't want to go to the wall, and you got there, and you realized with the kids and so forth that uh, it was special and it meant a whole lot and made a difference. Uh, thinking the same way, going back to Vietnam uh, may be special and make a difference. It may be, but my business partner likes to go with y'all, and both of us can't leave the office for that, that length of time. That's true. And so that's probably the, the one of the reasons that I, he's enjoying it, and he's, he is worked hard to do what he has done with your organization or with our organization and uh, helps helps out a lot it feels really good and I feel good about supporting him to go do that so I'm supporting it in my own way now well, we, we, one, we one, appreciate one thing about you go. talked about the wall yes. is that when the group of you drug me to the wall in I uh, don't remember that was that's probably 1992 um, to promise to hold right, we are. There were 15 of us in the back in a van on a on a, on a, in a, in a small van, and if I remember correctly, you were uh, folded up somewhere in the back. I was way in the back. In the tr what would have been the trunk? Lee and I were stuck in the trunk. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But first, when we went to the wall, and I was trying to remember the name of anybody I knew who was on the wall, and I couldn't do it because most of us knew people by nicknames, not real names, and it was raining at the wall. The clouds parted, and a, a, a ray of light came down and hit the wall on panel 65 on the east side. And it kind of lit up a name, and I looked at that, and I said, holy Moses, I knew that man. And 
it was a man, man by the name of Victor David Westfall, and his father, uh, who I had known, I had lived in New Mexico before I came east, Victor David Westfall Sr. set the Vietnam Brotherhood Chapel up in Angel Fire, New Mexico. And I had worked with Victor a lot trying to get photos of, of Vietnam vets, and it took probably about two years for Victor to get me to get into that chapel. And that was kind of the same way. It was a healing a uh, very healing time, going to the wall was very healing, and because of that experience with David, that's when I decided that we needed a co I needed to know more about the wall, so I did a lot of research on it, and we created a one-eighth scale replica of the wall, historically correct to five years ago, because I add names every year, and I haven't kept up to date, it's too expensive to, to do that, but we have a one-eighth scale here in Raleigh, and we can take it out and set it up and have it look just like the wall up in D.C., and we carry a book so people can find names, and that is also healing. That's kind of my way of contributing to the healing. And you, fortunately, have a little bit more access to the time to be able to go do that, so I'm happy when you take it out and, and get a chance to use it and display it. Well, Al is somewhat an artist, and uh, the wall, the, the one-eighth replica of the wall, the small wall as we call it, uh, it's amazing uh, when we carry that to some places how uh, much difference it makes. Al, we're running out of time. I just want to tell you how special it was having you today. Uh, you did a great job. We appreciate you coming back out. Uh, the next time we get together, Bob and I will be talking about uh, the, the Dirt Pounders. Uh, we're, one of our guests next time will be Mr. Joe Harsh, who was a LERP, Long Range Reconnaissance uh a man who went out with a helicopter, kicked him out about 2 o'clock in the morning, him and four or five other guys, and we'll talk about that next time we're on the show. Thank you for watching, and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much for listening. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Sundays, 9 a.m. till noon. Carrie's Psychic Cafe with Carrie Silkowski. Sundays, 8 till 9 p.m. Health In with Debbie Brooke. Mondays, 11 a.m. till noon. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon. Mondays, 1 till 2 p.m. Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members. The second and fourth Wednesday of each month from 7.30 till 8.30 p.m. Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, Wednesdays, 9 till 10 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by thatvidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net.